Hey, everybody. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. We're the leading organization for residential and commercial property inspectors. We train and, and certify home inspectors all over the world. And we do other things too, like free, live, interactive webinars like this one, where we're going to inspect this house. And um, if you wanted to attend a future live class, a webinar, go to this URL, nachi.org slash webinars. And uh, I've got my InterNACHI shirt on. Uh, people know me as Big Ben. That's my home inspection company, Big Ben Inspections. I got my coffee. You got your coffee? I can't see you. You should be able to see me. I can't hear you. You should be able to hear me. If you wanted to chat with um, other inspectors, feel free. If you're on the live chat, on the live webinar, there's a chat feature. Say hello, say from, um, from where you are. And uh, right now I'm from North Carolina and we have people all over the world. Uh, a friend of mine just said hello from South Korea. Awesome. And um, if you need to go and do a home inspection or do something else, all of our webinars are recorded, video recorded, so you can watch later. And again, that's at nachi.org slash webinars. So we're going to inspect this house. We're going to go through the house, inspect it, write an inspection report. It's going to take about an hour or two. Uh, feel free to ask questions on your side of the live webinar. If you're attending the live webinar, you can get a Q&A button going and feel free to ask questions. So all of our webinars, InterNACHI webinars are free, live, and open to everyone. You don't have to be a member of InterNACHI to attend one of our webinars. Again, it's at nachi.org slash webinars. If you're not a member of InterNACHI and you want to be a member, and you've never been one before, I have uh, a couple codes for you if you're interested. It's a free one-month membership for just trying us out. Um, you go to nachi.org, n-a-c-h-i dot n-a-c-h-i dot o-r-g slash trial, t-r-i-a-l, and enter the code webinar month, one word. And if you want a 50% discount of an entire year's membership, I've got that too. Go to nachi.org slash free and enter the code webinar. We're the only home inspector college for home inspectors, right? We're, we're free and online. It's a tuition-free college for home inspectors. So if you're thinking about taking a class or getting trained and certified or taking an exam, don't go to any unaccredited school. We're accredited by a national accrediting agency recognized by the US Department of Education. We have the same accreditation as any of the schools that are playing March Madness basketball right now. We are the only home inspector college on planet Earth. And that's at internachi.edu. Internachi.edu. If you're interested in business and marketing for home inspection businesses, right? And you want to just seems really complicated, but you want something just made simple for you, I've got it. It's inspection business and marketing made simple at nachi.org slash simple. I did a few videos, short videos, put them in a playlist. It's on YouTube. And I would just go through it, get your notebook out and uh, take some notes and um, give me a, a call or an email with any questions that you have about home inspection, business, and marketing. It's a lot of fun for me. One of the things that you need in relation to marketing to be a successful home inspector and to run a successful home inspection business is you gotta be online with a good, well-designed, customized home inspection website. And InterNACHI has negotiated with our official vendor, for home inspector websites. And that's at inspectorwebsitebuilder.com. Just Google inspector website builder. And that's at nachi.org slash website or 
inspectorwebsitebuilder.com. And they design websites for all of our InterNet G members. They, they design web, websites for only InterNet G members at an affordable price. Go check them out. But we're here to do a free live class about inspecting this house. I inspected this house and I wrote the inspection report as well. We're gonna take a look at that. So let's inspect this house, okay? Again, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A feature. I'm not gonna really look at the chat feature anymore. You guys can talk to each other on chat and I'm not looking at the live YouTube streaming either, but use the Q&A feature, okay? Let's inspect this house. Let's learn how it works. Let's find some problems. Let's talk about the standards of practice. I use inspection software. We can talk about software if you want and how to use it. I've got software on my phone. We can take a look at that. We'll read the report that I wrote. We can talk about how to get trained and certified. I love to talk about home inspection business, home inspection marketing. So just feel free to ask questions. We can talk about anything you want. Let's go through this home inspection. To be successful, you have to manage your time. If you're not managing your time, you're wasting it, right? And you're going to lose money. So what you want to think about is how efficient are you with your time? If you're managing other inspectors, time management is critical. Managing their time is critical. So most of my clients, they expect, you know, a two to three hour home inspection, according to the standards of practice. If you're doing like a termite inspection or a pool inspection or a, a roof certification, then it's a lot shorter in time. It could be less than an hour. But if you're doing a full home inspection, according to the standards of practice, and you're walking around with a client, it's going to be about two to three hours. So I wanted to show you my morning schedule for one home inspection in the morning. And I could be back at my home or my office, my home office with 500 bucks in, the, in, the, my, in my pocket or my business checking account. I want to show you how to make $500 in one morning as a home inspector. Doing home inspections is a lot of fun. But running a business, well, there's only really one reason you run a business. Like this. It's to make stacks of cash. To make a great living. And to make a great living, one of the things you have to do is you have to have a, a skill in time management. So what I do is I leave at around 7 a.m to get my first job in the morning at eight, right? And so I'm waking up at six, 6.30, something like that. Prepping my tools, getting dressed, making sure my truck is clean, leave the house at seven, leave early, could be traffic. I wanna arrive early at my first job, set out my tools, pull off my ladder off my truck, cause I bring tall ladders. You don't have to get on the roof. I do. That was my brand. And I inspect the roof. Knock on the door. Introduce myself. Sometimes people are home, sometimes not. I just say I'm a little early. Just here to tell you, you know, don't, <laughs> don't get all nervous. And, uh, you know, I wear identification. You know, you put, I don't know, I've got Big Ben on it, but can you see that? You know, wear a shirt that says inspector, you know. I would wear a shirt that says home inspector and maybe your logo, maybe your logo, maybe internet use logo. Just identify yourself as the home inspector, right? And then do the roof. I inspect the roof first because that's a system where I have to be alone. I'm not going to ask my client to get up on the roof with me. I don't want to talk to anybody when I'm up on the roof. It's the most dangerous part of the home inspection inspecting the roof from a ladder or from the roof surface. You can, you're required to inspect the roof, not required to inspect the roof 
from the roof, You're not required to walk upon any roof surface, You're not required to use a ladder. The word ladder doesn't even appear in InterNACHI's Home Inspection Standards of Practice. But I, you're required to inspect the roof. So I want to inspect the roof. And the way I do that, it's my personal choice, my business procedure, my business policy, we bring tall ladders. Before I was a home inspector, I was a home builder. So I was trained in using ladders. And we went up on the roof. So let's say you, you inspect the roof in one way or another, from the ground, from a ladder, from a, another vantage point, from getting up on the roof, or maybe use maybe use your drone, right? This is a DG, DJI mini drone. They're fantastic. This camera is 4K. It zooms. It's pictures and video. You have to, in the United States, you have to be licensed. There are regulations in every country, essentially, I think. In the United States, you have to take a pilot license. And internet actually helps you prepare for that exam. But you have to inspect the roof. Eight o'clock, my client shows up. And we're going to inspect the exterior. I invite my client around with me. And as I'm inspecting, I'm taking pictures as well. That's the second system. And then we go inside and we inspect the big stuff, the heavy lifting, the important systems, HVAC, plumbing, water heater, electrical, structure, those big items, the foundation. And then at about 10 o'clock, two hours in, I should find myself, oh, let's, let's type that, oh, there we go, structure. I find myself in the attic. And when I'm in the attic, or I'm in the top part of the, the structure, the house, and I'm looking at the ceiling, maybe there's an attic access, maybe it's a flat roof or something, I know that I'm right on schedule. And then I've got the interior, the bathrooms, the garage, the kitchen, and I end up in the kitchen. I like to end my inspections in the kitchen and get paid, shake hands, and make sure that I am networking. I'm bringing my current client at this inspection into my client database, into my client network, into my client base, whatever you want to call it. They're now my client. They're my neighbors. I'm going to take good care of them because maybe I can do another inspection for them or Maybe I could use them. I could leverage them to do word of mouth marketing. Maybe they, they can talk to other people. Maybe they, they can get a, I can get a Google review from them. I'll probably get a Google review at the inspection in the kitchen right after they said that, you know, they're happy with my inspection and they paid me. I'm going to give them my phone and it's, there's going to be a link to my business Google review. Now they're telling other people how good my inspection is. All of my clients should be talking well of me because I am efficient with my time. I'm thorough and I do a great home inspection and I inspect everything. That's how you make 500 bucks in the morning as a home inspector. You manage your time. So let's inspect this house. Every home inspection starts with the standards of practice. You think about your time. So you have to somehow go to the standards of practice, which, which lists all the things you're required to inspect and not inspect and put it into a process. So the standards of practice is the foundation upon which to build your inspection process. It is the beginning point. It is the common point between all home inspections. All home inspectors follow a standards of practice. Even if you're in a non-regulated state or province, you have to be inspecting according to a standards of practice. And that's InterNACHI standards of practice. InterNACHI is the world's 
international organization for home inspectors. So if you're in Italy, you have to perform an inspection according to a standards of practice. And if there isn't anything local to follow, because local regulations overrule international ones. So follow your local rules first. Then you can follow, if that, if that doesn't exist, follow international standards. And that will tell you what to do first, second, third, fourth. It'll help you through. So like my process, right? I started with the roof because I show up early. I don't want anybody with me. I have to focus. It's very dangerous. I'm going to perform an inspection before my client even shows up of the roof, take pictures, write my inspection report on my mobile software, take pictures. And then before I get down on my ladder and onto the ground, I'm actually done inspecting that system. I am done writing the report for that section of the report. And I can move on. Now I'm being really efficient with my time. If I do the exterior next, I'm going to inspect it and write the report at the same time. So that when I go to the third system, HVAC, right? That's my third system at 815 with my client. I'm talking with my client. I'm inspecting systems and I'm writing the report. By the time I get to the kitchen, I'm done with my entire inspection. I've written the entire inspection report and I can, with a click of a button, send or present a summary of my inspection to my client, just like that. And that was part of my brand. A brand is something that answers the question, why should I hire you instead of anybody else? Well, one of the reasons you would hire me instead of the next, next inspector would be because I'm efficient with my time. I write the inspection report. And at the end of the report, I'll give you a summary of the report immediately. You don't have to wait 24 hours. So I beat all that competition who, who were writing reports in 24 to 48 hours. What are you doing? You're writing the report with a pencil and paper. You have to get home inspection software. Probably the most expensive thing in your business is going to be the software. Get good stuff. Make sure it goes on your phone. Make sure you can write the report as you inspect so that you're efficient with your time. Because in the general rule of business is you want to make a lot of money in a little bit of time. You want to increase gross revenue and divide it by time. You want to make $500, for example, and divide it by three hours. $600, let's make the math easy. You want to make $600 and divide by three hours. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good dollar amount per hour, I would say. That's why home inspectors are really successful and happy. They're providing an extreme, they're providing incredible value, very important information at a critical moment in a home buyer's time. It's the most important decision most people will ever make, financial decision, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they hire a home inspector to inspect the home to make sure Everything is in good shape. They learn about the house, how it works. They look for problems, talk about home maintenance, talk about monitoring things that may wear out in the future. And then you get this assurance that everything's going to be okay when you move in. Or if there is a problem, what do we do about it? That's incredible, valuable information. And you should charge based upon that value. When you provide incredible value to some, some client of yours, um, you should charge for that. <laughs> because it's a good price for them. It's a good decision for them. If, if the perceived value is much greater than the cost, then it's a good decision. So if the perceived value is incredible for your clients, then the amount of money that you make in this morning schedule here is worth it. 
you charge $500, $600 for this schedule here, you're going to inspect all these things. There's a thousand things to check in a home inspection. You're going to charge five, six hundred, four hundred dollars. That's that's a great price. You're providing, you want to overwhelm your in business, you want to overwhelm your clients with the perceived value. So that value is much greater than the cost. If it is, then it's a good business decision. It's a good decision for your clients to hire you. So again, you want to make a lot of money, divide it by an efficient amount of time. You don't want to take all day doing a home inspection. So you inspect according to his standards. And the first thing in the standards of practice is the roof. And that's the first thing I do. I get there early and I inspect the roof. This is me. There's my ladder. There's my 40 foot aluminum ladder. There's my 32 foot fiberglass ladder. I'm using my 28 foot fiberglass ladder. That's my, that's my track right there. And that's me on the roof. I take a picture like that so that I can stick that in my marketing and in my flyers and on my website and in my social media and on my Instagram and on my Facebook. And I post that picture so that people know what I do. I walk upon the roof. You're not required to walk upon the roof. Here, let's see if we can do a poll together. Let's see if I can do this. Can I do this? If you are um, attending this live event, let's see if I can. Here's a poll. You should be able to see a poll. If you're on YouTube, you're not going to probably see it. And if you're just watching this video, you're probably not going to be able to see it. But tell me if you can see a poll. Are you? Can you see a poll? There's a question, a poll, P-O-L-L, -L, a question. And the question is, are home inspectors required to walk on the roof according to the InterNACHI Home Inspection Standards of Practice? If you've been paying attention, you should be getting this. A uh, couple, well, one of you got the wrong answer. That's okay. Keep going. Keep going. 76% of you have participated in this. Awesome. You don't have to chat it. I guess if you can't see the, the question on your screen, then yep, chat it. But a lot of folks are answering the question. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll. That's pretty good. I'm going to share the results. So maybe you can see these results in your on your screen during the live webinar. 97% of you got the answer correct. No is the answer. Home inspectors are not required to walk upon any roof surface according to the standards of practice. Excellent. Good job. Okay. So that's me inspecting the roof. That's my hand upon the roof shingles. I love to put my hands on things that I'm inspecting so I can show people that I was actually there inspecting it up close. But I take a picture of every roof surface, every system, and then I break it down into components. But on a roof, looking at every... I'm just looking for big holes, cracks, missing shingles, damage, improperly installed things, th things that are missing, things that are just anomalies. I'm not measuring the roof. I don't measure anything. I don't quantify anything. I'm just looking for things that don't look right because I'm trained to see, I'm trained by Internet Chief to look at systems and components and I know how things are supposed to be installed and also have an idea about defects, common defects. That's what we do at Internet. We teach you about how things are properly installed and also how to identify defects. Right here, I'm pulling up a shingle tab looking for step flashing, which are pieces of metal where the roof shingle intersects with the wall here, house wall. That's a roof vent providing ventilation. There's the main sewer stack, drain waste vent stack. That's the house stack, sewer stack. That has flashing around it. That's in good shape. The gutters are in good shape. Nothing wrong with the gutters, no major defects. What I like to say is I did not observe any indications of major defects during my inspection of the system or gutter, something like that. There's the chimney stack. So I know it's a, a heating system chimney. Stack. It's not a fireplace. Fireplace in, in North America are rectangular. Um, the flues are rectangular. So this is a square chimney stack. It's a flue for probably uh, 
a gas-fired heating system and or hot water heating system, something like that. The top is slightly cracked, the crown, the wash, the, the sloped, slanted masonry cap that is on top of the chimney top stack that surrounds the flue. That is cracked. We don't want any cracks there. We want it nice and watertight. We want to divert water away from the chimney stack interior. So those cracks need to be repaired. That's a minor, easy crack to do. Looks like there's been some repair in the past. The black stuff that's on, let's see if I can bring some fancy, there we go. So this, can you see that green arrow there? The green circle. So that tar there, that's probably from a, an old flashing patch that was done there before. Maybe a, excuse me, this is a, a newer roof. This is a shot of the chimney flue. With my camera, you're not required to inspect the interior flue liner of any chimney stack as a home inspector. But if it's open, I'm going to take a look at it. Because sometimes in the past, I have, and then I'll find a, a hole right here, and I can comment on that. If I see a defect, even if it's on a system or component that I'm not required to inspect, let's say um, another example would be, uh, well, this is the example. I'm not required to inspect the interior flu line, but if I see a defect in the interior flu line, I'm going to report it, put it in my inspection report. I'm going to tell my client about it. And then I follow water. I imagine a rainstorm, because water is fantastic. It brings life, but it can destroy a building, water, water and moisture. So I think about how a heavy rainstorm, um, how the house controls rainwater during a rainstorm and moisture. So this is a downspout. It's bringing the water down from the roof, from the gutters, which are clean. I'm gonna see where that rainwater goes when I get down. But as I'm coming down, I'm looking at anything that I can. I'm not gonna move my ladder around all over the place. I'm not required to inspect every window, but if I'm going past the window, I'm gonna take a look. There's a lot to see. There's a header flashing. There's flashing around here. There's bottom flashing. The deferred flashing, there's sealant, there's drainage, there's screens, there's window panes. I take a lot. There's the first floor. So here's the second floor window coming in contact with the first floor window. It's band joist here. There's the window itself looking at how different materials interact with each other. There's a shot of my ladder and there's the downspout coming out here. I want to see that's being diverted away from the house. I want water to shed away from the roof. This roof is not supposed to be waterproof. Asphalt shingles, sloped asphalt shingles, doesn't have to, it's not guaranteed. Uh, any roof can leak. An asphalt shingle roof can leak as well. It's just supposed to be water resistant. It's supposed to divert water away. So if you're inspecting a roof, you can't guarantee that it's, it could leak the next day if it rains. And you're not responsible as a home inspector for that roof leak. You can inspect a roof, you can inspect a heating system, you can inspect a dishwasher, and the next day it could fail. The heating system could fail. The dishwasher could leak. The roof could leak the next day. And as a home inspector, you can't, you're not responsible, responsible for those things, those future events, no matter how bad they are. You can't predict the future. That's not what a home inspection is. A home inspection isn't a guarantee of future performance. A, a, a home inspector is essentially there to do one thing, report upon the defects that were both observed during the home inspection and considered to be material or very serious, major defects. Those are the, that's what you're responsible for as a home inspector. Exterior, exterior is next in the standards of practice. There's the exterior, exterior starts with the downspouts and how the roof handles that. Even if you're in a dry climate, semi-arid climate, imagine a one in a million roof, um, sorry, rainstorms, right? You have to still imagine a rainstorm. That's how I think about it. Even if you're in a, well, I've never inspected a house in an arid climate. Uh, let's see. 
There's the ground sloping away from the house, the downspout discharging roof water away from the house. Everything is sloped away. I can't see everything because of the dense vegetation. This is okay. This is slightly sloped away. There's clearance between the bottom of the house siding and the grade. That's good. Taking a look at the siding materials on the outside. It's a vinyl siding, some aluminum capping. There's the soffit vent. You know, a lot of what home inspectors do is simply identify things. We identify the type of siding material. We identify that this is brick and this is vinyl siding and this is channel and this is sealant mortar. So I'm looking at anything and everything. And I'm still imagining how rainwater runs down the house and off this roof and down the window. Is it extended out? Can this water drip? Or is there something missing here, like flashing? Can this flashing here allow water to get behind and inside the wall somehow? So these are my inspection pictures. Exposed concrete foundation, there's brick wall, and then components that I've come across while I'm inspecting the exterior. So now I've done the roof. I'm on the exterior. My client is walking around with me. I'm taking pictures. I'm talking to my client, answering questions as well. I'm also inspecting. And this looks to me like a dryer exhaust because it has lint in it. It's not a bathroom. It's not a kitchen exhaust. So it's a dryer exhaust. And I don't want this for my client. I want a nice proper hood. This is improper. You don't want something that could clog up the dryer exhaust. So these louvers here could get stuck and then it could block the exhaust of the dryer. And when uh, dryer exhausts are blocked or restricted in some way, that could cause a fire hazard, potential fire hazard. So what we want is an, a nice hood that opens up fully and allows the dryer to exhaust outside. All dryers are required to exhaust outside. Looking for trip hazards, looking at the steps, looking at the front door, the header looks good, the bottom looks good. At the bottom of every window and door, I take a look to see if there's wood rot at the bottom corners, see if there's flashing here so that the weather stripping is in good shape. I see if the frame of the door is square. Here's a, a step, uh, a stoop. And it's kind of like a flat elevated surface at the front door right here. So you come out and you walk upon this surface, but there's no railing. Now code, building code standards, say that if this is high enough, there should be a railing, right? So it's 30 inches. So the standard is if this surface here is 30 inches, almost three feet, code says you should have a railing. But what if it's 28 inches? Well, that's code says you don't need a railing. But what if you're a home inspector and you're like, you know, my, my client, she's 75 years old. And I just don't want my client to fall off of this. So I'm going to, I'm not a code inspector. I may make a recommendation or a comment about a railing. You may want a railing here. So that when you come out and you lose your balance, maybe, you don't want to fall off into the bushes and onto the ground here. You want to you want something to hold on to, a guard, a guard with a handrail or something like that. Right? So you're not a code inspector. Because code inspectors, the first thing a code inspector is going to do is going to, they're going to take out their measuring tape and measure something. They're going to quantify something, right? They're going to measure it. And if it doesn't meet, well, you don't need a railing. But what about home inspectors? You're not, you're not a code inspector. Right? You're, look, you're, you're observing the condition of the home and favoring your clients. Your opinion is supposed to help your client. So don't worry too much about code. If you're taking InterNACHI's courses through the InterNACHI Home Inspector School, the only accredited college for home inspectors, you'll actually be taking courses that are based upon code. We don't, we don't 
talk about code. We talk about being a home inspector because you want to be a home inspector. You want to say things that make sense. Code often doesn't make sense. Code doesn't care really about what your client needs at that time. That's a patch on the concrete. That's a minor thing. Here's a sidewalk. You don't want any trip hazards here. Here's the parking area. Park my truck there. Everything looks good in the parking area. If you get trained by InterNACHI or CCPIA, you can get trained on how to inspect parking areas like this. There's a community townhouse community and the parking areas are here and you can inspect this. Is this, is this, to, is this safe? Is this according to a standard? How wide are the parking spaces supposed to be? You know, And maybe it's a HOA, maybe these lines that are kind of worn out they could be repainted. And who does that? Probably not the seller. It's probably a, a townhouse community association that takes care of the parking areas. Here's some steps that go up to the front door. This handrail here is not graspable. You can't grab it. It's a big two by eight, uh, six laying flat and you can't grab it, right? Maybe the house was built to code back then. And code back then in 19 whatever, this is this was okay. But maybe your client, again, maybe your client needs to grab onto something as they are walking up the stairs. And this isn't graspable. Code says it has to be a handrail is different from a guard. A handrail is something defined as something you grab. <laughs> and you can't grab anything here. And there's a bunch of steps here. And code says code. You have to have four risers. There's a tread and a riser, tread and a riser. You have to have four of them before code says you're required to have a handrail. Well, you're a home inspector. If your client can't get up one riser, one step without holding on to someone's hand or a handrail, well, maybe they need a handrail. So you can go beyond code. You have the freedom to comment on code, use code as a reference, but you can you can make comments that are in favor of your client so that they can enjoy living in a home that's well-suited for them, that's safe for them. Maybe they're buying a home from someone who doesn't need a handrail every step, but, they, but they're moving into a home and they need a handrail. See, you're not a code inspector. You're just, you're just a home inspector and that's a fantastic place to be. Fantastic. Oh, Forgot to play this video. I do videos too. No missing shingles, nothing cracked or damaged. Remember, my client is not with me. Metal flashing. I don't take my client with me. Sidewalls of the house next door. There's flashing around this main sewer vent pipe. That's in good shape. There's flashing where the chimney stack is. The chimney stack for the heating system is in good shape. There's some minor hairline cracks. Who looks okay from what I can see above? Ventilation hood there. And ventilation for the eye. And the gutters in the front. It'll be clean. So it looks like a good roof. So my clients loved it because they weren't able to go up on a roof with me, but I, I was able to show them the roof. Full force. That's okay. Just watch your step off the front stoop. There's no guardrail. Yep. And I take pictures and also video. If my client is not there, I'll take a lot of video. The receptacles are protected by a ground fall. That's good. Because people just love to watch videos. So get software that allows you to take pictures and video and incorporate them in your report. Reports are now online. They're in the cloud. So you do the, your inspection report and it sends it to the cloud. And now you can upload videos right into your inspection report, right? No longer are we writing with our hands and, and pencil and paper. I used to. Okay, so we're doing the exterior. This is the gas meter. There's a gas line going in, sealed up. That's a gas shutoff valve. I want to identify that for my client. It's a pressure regulator. Heating and cooling is next in the standards of practice. Here's the air conditioner unit. Man, that is old. 
that's that older than the roof. The roof has been replaced. The heating system hasn't. Air conditioning hasn't. This is an old one. It's so old that the manufacturing label is worn out. You can't even see any of it. There's the discharge tube from the condensate. Air conditioners, the air handler will produce condensate. It's going to be discharged outside. Somehow control that water. The air conditioners, air handlers produce condensate. And there's a whole, we had a whole training class on just how to inspect condensate from an air conditioner. There's the electrical shutoff. I don't like that they have it locked with a twisty thing. That's okay. And there's the, oh, what do we got here? The air conditioner is original to the house. So it's at the end of its life expectancy, but we've got it turning on right now. It sounds good. A little rust on the electric disconnect. Some foam insulation could be replaced. Okay, that's the neighbor's um, air conditioner. You know, I inspect my neighbors, you know, I inspect it everywhere around. I take a, take a look, like if your neighbor's air conditioner system has been replaced, that's probably pretty good indication for your client. That's good information for your client to know that your neighbor just replaced theirs. It's a brand new one. So take a look at this one. Take a look at your neighbors. What do you think is gonna happen soon, right? Start budgeting to replace your air conditioner. Inside, here's a heating system and water heating equipment. I wanted to show you this one. This is a, this is a very old natural draft gas-fired furnace heating system. Forced air, right? Natural draft means air goes in through here, through the heat exchanger, and up through the flue. I mean, it's pretty crazy. Uh, this is the, the draft, but this is where the burner is. So this is natural draft. There's a long, they don't make them anymore. If you see one of these things, just flag it. It's, it's got to be replaced. So it's natural gas because I can see the gas meter on the outside that we saw going through the gas valve, shutoff valve. There's the drip. And then the hard line going in, we'll take a look at inside it's forced air i could see the duct work here so this is the air that returns into the system through an air filter circulated by a blower fan heated up and then cooled off this is the other side the back side of the unit when i have something metal resting on a concrete floor i like to look for rust in the bottom this is the air conditioner air handler interior coil that produces condensate I want service tags from recent service. If it hasn't been serviced and clean within the past year, I put that in a report as a recommendation. We touched the refrigerant line on the outside, which is all worn out. This is the insulated suction line, refrigerant line for the interior coil here is the liquid line. It circulates. When it's on, the suction line should be cool to the touch. And it's cooled because that's the refrigerant in there and it's insulated um, so that it retains that energy, doesn't release it, doesn't absorb heat essentially. And um, also uh, condensate is produced and there's the condensate drain. So there's a tray underneath the coil of the air conditioner this is above the heating system. We don't want condensate water to drain on top of a heating system. That's bad. So we collect it and we drain it down into a pump that pump then discharges that outside. We saw that tube on the outside. And there it is there. So we know that's working. We, ideally, we want this tube to be discharging far away from the house. There's an electrical receptacle right next to the heating system and cooling system. The pump, some pump is plugged in. There's a service switch there. You hit the service switch in order to get to the air filter, which is blow, um, by the blower fan. So this is the return duct work through the air filter. This is how um, you would explain how systems work to your client, right? This is how I think. I mean, if I can explain how a, a heating cooling system works, then uh, that's my job. I'm supposed to educate my clients on how things work, how to maintain them, maybe how to save energy, how to keep things safe. So air is returning through. You got to change change that air filter. How do you change it? You turn the system off, you open up the bottom panel, you get to the air filter, change it every 30 days or so. This system is so old. It is, uh, it's dated, but if you didn't know how to date a heating or cooling system, um, here's this organization I found online. 
I have no idea who runs it. It's called building-center.org. If you go there, you can type in the serial number of um, heating systems and find out when that heating system was actually manufactured. That's not required as a home inspector according to the standards of practice, but it, good information. There's a shutoff valve, gas shutoff valve. There's the pilot light mechanism, the gas valve. There's the burners of the heating system, right? And the pilot is a very old heating system. And there's natural draft. There's the flu and it goes into the, it makes a bend and it goes into the chimney stack that we saw. So this is the, the flu connection pipe from the heating system. This is from the hot water tank going into the chimney that we saw from the outside. Remember, we took a shot of the flu from the, from the top. Well, now I've got a pretty good idea. I can, I can see what's entering the chimney. And I can see that from the chimney from the top. Here's the blower fan. I opened up the panel. Here's the air filter that filters the air as it comes back, as it returns to the heating and cooling system. And this needs to be installed properly. This was installed backwards. That's okay. But there's a little arrow on these types of um, low efficiency, cheap, um, disposable air filters. And there's the size. So I would show my client this and I would tell them what to do to keep the place clean, the indoor air quality. Next is water heating equipment, according to the standards of practice. We call it water heating equipment. You can call it a water heater, a uh, water tank. It's really any appliance that heats up uh, potable water and distributes it to the house fixtures. And you can look up the code if you wanted to. Um, 2021 IRC, Chapter 28, International Residential Code, Chapter 28. It talks about water heating equipment. And you can learn a lot from code about all the systems and components. So this is a, I consider this as a system, water heating equipment, the water tank, and it's filled with a bunch of components and you simply identify the components. So when I inspect, I, I think of systems and then I go in closer and I check every component of that system. So here's the gas shutoff valve. Here's the temperature regulator dial. Here's the flue pipe going into the chimney stack. There's the cold water supply coming in, a water shutoff valve. There's a hot water coming out. There's a temperature pressure relief valve, TPR valve extended to the floor. The bottom of the tank, it's not rusted. So that's good. It's not leaking. So it's in good shape. That was it. You can also get the size from the manufacturing label and other things. It's a small little 40-gallon hot water tank. It's about right. Next is plumbing. I'm being efficient with my time. And I'm... I just finished that section in my inspection report. That's all. Inspect I inspected it. I wrote about it. I took pictures, video. I'm done. I'm moving on. I'm doing well. And my client is learning a lot about the sewer system. For example, this is made out of cast iron and copper. The copper line. That's a, that looks like a toilet right, flange right there. And the sewer goes out through the foundation underground. And I take a look to see if there anything's leaking. I don't see anything leaking. That's good. There's a copper pipe from the toilets. There's a copper pipe, standing pipe from the laundry and the laundry discharge there. There's an outdoor water faucet that I didn't see when I was outside. So I remember this inspection. I told my client, I, you know, we should have a hose bib, a water faucet, a hose faucet on the outside somewhere. I can't I think they put one in. That's kind of odd. Now, I put it in my report, like something you can maybe consider installing, you know. I couldn't see it because I couldn't see it. It was buried under dense vegetation. Do you remember that vegetation bush? There? It was there, but I couldn't see it. Am I responsible as a home inspector for things I, I can't see? No. What if it's a defect? What if there, it's a defect and I can't see it during a home inspection? Am I responsible for defects that I can't see during a home inspection? No. Am I responsible for defects that I don't observe during a home inspection? No. If I was doing a home inspection right now and there was a, a defect above my head and I don't observe it, it won't be in the report. If I look up, and I see, uh, I see that 
but I don't think, I don't consider it a major problem. I see it, but it's, it's no big deal. It won't be in the report. What's required of a home inspector is you're required to report upon things that you both observe, I see it during the inspection, and you deem it or consider it, you identify it, you would describe it as a material defect, a, a really serious defect, something that will have an adverse impact on the value of the home or put someone's life in danger. Those kind of defects, if you see them, it should be in the report. But this thing, I didn't even see this thing. So I went back into my software on the exterior and I took out that comment about a missing hose bib. Boop, took it out. There it is. It's somewhere there, right? And that's a water shut off valve. Every hose bib should have a shut off valve so that it can be repaired or replaced. So that's the shut off valve there. There's the valve to the outdoor faucet. Basement, foundation, crawl space, structure. That's what the standards of practice says I got to inspect. Can't see the floor structure. Am I required to remove all these ceiling tiles during the inspection? There's a hundred of them. Am I required to lift every ceiling tile up and then go to the next one? Uh, no. This is an inspection restriction. I'm not required to, I'm not required to inspect everything. I'm not even required to find all the defects. It's impossible. So if you want to make $500 in the morning, right, as a home inspector, don't think you have to, don't be overwhelmed by this business. You know, make sure you understand what you are required and not required to do. And you're not required to predict future events. You're not required to guarantee anything is going to work. You're not required to find all the problems of the house. You're not required to inspect everything. You can't possibly inspect everything. And yet, what you do as a home inspector is incredibly valuable. Okay. You're helping your neighbors with the biggest decision of their life at an affordable price. It's pretty good. Pretty good service. Keep it up. Uh, there's my um, tools. So I bring down my tools when I go into the basement. This, this house is a full basement, underground, and there's the window. Um, that's a moisture meter, and I still have them. You see? There you go. Yep. So here's a uh, few tools. Same tools. They still make them. This is a gardening tool. This is a, a, a three tine hoe. It's a gardening tool and it's extendable. So I can reach up and probe things. It's also curled a little bit so I can grab insulation and put it back. And then this is an extendable um, system as well. And it's a moisture meter, so it extends out, and then these pins extend out. And this is a moisture meter, so I can probe down there, or down there, and I don't, I don't measure anything. I just want to know if it's wet. So, so, yeah. So these tools are really valuable to me, so that I can reach up, grab stuff, probe things, pick at things, and I can probe the moisture meter. The pins go through the carpeting, through the padding and touch the floor system, the concrete floor to see if it's damp. And it's not, this house is relatively dry. Can't find anything wrong. That's a smoke detector. Now I'm just, you know, inspecting other things, the foundation, the structure. Looks like there was a water leak in the past. I use my probe, it's not actively leaking. So that looks good. Here's my flashlight. I actually like to show that I use a flashlight. So I'll grab my flashlight. I'll put it in the picture, my inspection picture, right? Get a high lumens flashlight. It's something that's really bright. And I like this one because, can you see that? Let's see, where can we, you see this? There it is, I can't see that. Really? You can't see that? <laughs> Okay, well, here, I'm going to show you like this, right? So here's my flashlight. And if you uh, 
go down like that, the the flashlight is really wide. And if you pull it out, it concentrates it. And it's like this little square like that. Oh, maybe I can do that. There you go. There. And then that's the wide. And that helps me inspect things. It allows me to see things that I wouldn't be able to see without it. That's what a flashlight is. Flash, the word flashlight is not in the standards of practice. You are exceeding the standards of practice if you use a flashlight. So don't worry about, well, you're not supposed to exceed this. Yes, you are. You're allowed to exceed the standards of practice. If you're going to use a flashlight, you are exceeding the standards of practice. It's a visual only inspection. But this thing allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. And it's similar to this. Flashlight's like an infrared camera. Here's my FLIR camera. It allows me to see things I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. So my infrared camera allows me to see stuff. Every home inspector should have an infrared camera. Infrared cameras allow home inspectors to see things that other inspectors can't. The neat thing about a, a moisture meter, oh, sorry, the neat thing about an infrared camera is that you need a moisture meter with it. Because the two go together. These are companions, a moisture meter and an infrared camera. Because a moisture meter will, will confirm your observations using an infrared camera. Because the infrared camera will kind of show you like, oh, this could be wet. And so your moisture meter is needed. So don't use one without it, the other one. There's me probing with my moving insulation, you know, and I'm, I'm moving stuff around, just taking a look. Who knows what's behind insulation? Then I, I inspect a representative number of wall receptacles. And that's it for the basement. The garage, there's no garage in this house. Next system would be electrical. And from the outside, I saw this electrical meter. There's the electrical line to the panel. And I'm trying to reach the grounding wire, grounding electrode conductor. And there's the rod and there's the clamp. That looks good. There's some phone and cable things going on there. And let's see. Oh, I did a video. The telephone boxes here in junctions. Electric meter box, secure for the house well. The electric line looks good. Looks like 100 amps. When we have gas applied to the house, the gas meter. That looks in good shape. And I see a grounding wire from the electrical panel to a grounding rod. That's good. Yeah. And there's the electrical panel. One finger means 100 amps, two fingers means. 200 amps, one and a half is uh, 150 amps. That's the main disconnect. I identify that um, for my clients to shut off in an emergency all the electricity to the house. You have some room for additional breakers and there's some breakers in there and they're labeled. Uh, they're not labeled. So every, every breaker should be identified specifically. And so that's an improvement. It's not a major thing. I'm not jumping up and down about it. I can't get the panel off. I like to take the electrical panel off, but this like trim board here is in the way. So I like to, there's like this thing, there's, there's the bolt on the dead front cover and I can't get to it. So I'm going to take the, this trim board off and now I can access it, right? I removed this trim board. Now I can access the panel. So there was a bit of an inspection restriction there. And there's the inside of the electrical panel. You're not required to remove the dead front cover off of the electrical panel. But I like to. It's dangerous. Don't do it. It's not required. I don't recommend it. But some inspectors do. And what I want to do is I want to see the gauge of the wire according to the size of the breaker. I don't want a really big fat breaker on a thin gauge wire. That's an opacity problem over fusing. It's too big of a breaker on a small wire it would cause melting and arcing and over fuse, or overheating and all that good stuff. We don't want that. Looks in pretty good shape. Grounding, and grounding and bonding, neutrals. You know, if you take the International Residential Electrical course, we talk about grounding and bonding. It's probably one of the weak areas of home inspectors. We're not too good with electrical. But InterNACHI has really good courses, free online from the Home Inspector College. Don't take an unaccredited course. Um, 
some inspectors bring extra uh, than front cover fasteners, bolts. Got to get the right ones with the flat heads. So let's see, there's another pull. Let's see, let's do another one, shall we? Let's see, electrical panel, here it is. So folks, if you are attending the live class, you can answer this question. And the question is, are home, or you can chat the, the answer if you want. Are home inspectors required to remove the electrical panels dead front cover according to InterNACHI's home inspection standards of practice? So are you doing well? I know that there's a, a state standards of practice that requires home inspectors to walk the roof. And someone told me there's one that requires you to remove the dead front, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about InterNACHI's home inspection standards of practice. Are you required to remove the electrical panels, dead front cover? All right, a lot of you are participating. Let's end the poll. Let's check it out. Let's share the results. And there's the results. 94% of you said no, which is correct. Good job. Uh, Glenn just asked, when using, let's stop sharing. Good job on the poll. You're not required to remove the dead front cover of the electrical panel. When using a moisture meter, are there certain areas you'll probe more than others or randomly spot check? Um, I will, um, there are certain areas. I'm not gonna inspect everything. I will inspect things that may indicate a prior leak. So if I see a ceiling panel with watermarks, I'm gonna grab my infrared camera and moisture meter and use both to see if it's active, right? Um, and then, if so, that if there's a an indicator, an indication, an anomaly, something telling me visually that there's something that could have happened in the past here, why don't we probe this? I'll inspect that area and also corners, the bottom corner of things in the basement. If I'm underground, I'm going into the corners and along the perimeter, the exterior perimeter. And I'm going to probe with this around the entire exterior exterior perimeter. Ah. Uh, if there's a deck and there's indications of flashing problems on the outside where the deck is attached to the house, it's called the ledger flashing. I may use this or at least use the other thing that my gardening tool to get in there to see if I can find something, right? Any indications of dry, a, a past water leak, even if they're dry, I'm gonna probe it with this. I'm gonna take a look at it with the infrared camera as well. Um, I would uh, use a moisture meter if you want to uh, probe around where the shower meets the, the tub or where the tub meets the floor in the corners, that's a good name. Around the base of a toilet, that's a good one. Inside a cabinet underneath the sink, that's a good one for a moisture meter. That's about it. Um, da -da 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 -da. Have been several other questions in chat. Is it possible to end of it? Oh yeah, okay. So let me go back up in chat. I don't look at chat for questions. I'm looking at Q and A for questions. When the water heater is inside a garage, is it okay to discharge TPR water on the floor as long as it can drain away from the structure, but inside the basement, it should be diverted outside the building? Uh, did you know that there are, according to code, so, so cool. Go to chapter 28 of the, International Residential Code. There are 14 requirements for the TPR valve, discharge pipe. Not the valve, just the discharge pipe. There are four, uh, less, less, I think it's 14. 14 things. Now, how am I supposed to remember that uh, it should discharge into the same room? It shouldn't go through, the discharge pipe cannot go through a wall and discharge somewhere else. It has to be conspicuous right next to the, the water heating equipment. Conspicuous means like if it discharges, everyone's supposed to see it. So if it's discharging through something like the basement floor, right? Through a hole, it, no, it's not conspicuous. It actually has to be conspicuous. It has to drain out so that people can see that we have a water problem here. We have a temperature pressure problem at the water heater tank. Could explode, right? So that's one of the 14 things. So the, I would just go over those 14 things. It's in our plumbing course, by the way, residential plumbing course, those, those that TPR stuff. And um, so, yeah, I would go over that 
And then I put those 14 things in my checklist. Like it's not supposed to go up. The TPR discharge pipe can't go up. Can't even go up at an angle. It has to uh, discharge by gravity, right? Has to be conspicuous. Has to discharge right there. It can discharge into the drain. It could discharge into the garage. I would collect it, right? I'd make sure there's a drain there. I, I re make recommend it because I'm not a code inspector. I make a recommendation to install a water catch pan underneath every hot water tank. And I don't care if it's in the basement on a concrete floor, right? So being a home inspector is a lot better than being a code inspector. Take code, reference it, and then build upon your comments. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Keep going with the chat. Good inspector was sued for missing a dry rot on the dark. Uh, a good home inspector was sued here for missing dry rot on the dark crawl space rim joist. Well, um, there's, you know, who knows what actually happened and what the report and what was thought, but uh, there's, there's a couple things. Like I've been sued. I've been uh, brought into small claims for things that I, that I was, that we were not responsible for. And one of them was um, termite infestation that was hidden, right? Under a grand piano that was on top of our piece of carpet in the room that had termite infestation on the floor joists. Okay, I can't see the floorboards, the floorboards, the floorboards underneath the carpet with a baby grand piano on top of it, right? So you have to, tell your client that you can't see everything. You're not moving furniture or baby grand pianos, <laughs> you know, lifting up carpets either. That I, I, in my reports, I like for the roof section, I think at the top, you can use any of my reports and use any of my language. Copy paste it right into yours if you'd like. I, I write in the top section of the roof that this roof is going to leak. Just assume that you're going to have a roof leak because I'm not guaranteeing the performance of the roof. Assume that you are going to find defects. I put this in the last page, that you're going to find problems that I didn't see during the inspection, but only you will see after you move in. You know why? Because everything's all cleaned up. The seller removed everything, all the furniture, all the carpeting, all the drapes, all the storage items. That's all gone now. Now, of course, you can see more. That's why I recommend hiring me to go through the home with you during closing, just before closing, pre-closing walkthrough, so we can see things again, right? Um, I just set my client's expectations that I'm not here to guarantee everything, that I am, I am, I'm not going to inspect everything. I won't see everything, but I'm, I will put it in the report Defects that I both observe and deem to be material according to the standards of practice. And that's in our agreement. That's in the standards of practice. And that's in my inspection report. And that's what me and my client agreed to. So I think that's how you handle those things. Oh boy, there's a lot going on in chat. Let's see. I should go backwards. Can you see the chat? If I bring it over into this window, I don't know if you can see it. It's floating above the laundry picture. Um, should be long out unless the older systems start. Mm, let me look at chat. Someone says uh, three to f three or four hours to do a good inspection. Two hours only if it's a small apartment. Uh, what report software are you using? Are you Spectora? Um, Steven says, I do too, Home Gauge, Home Inspector Pro. Can Inspector own a construction company also? Yes. Uh, and being on the roof up and close gives enormous visual tactile information. Is it possible to get the same level of information confidence of inspecting with a drone? No. I mean, I can pick up a shingle and feel that it's brittle or not. I can, I can pull up a shingle tab to see if it's attached to the layer below, right, with my fingers. I can move my hand across the granular surface and see if they're detaching and washing away or not. 
There's so many things I can do by touching it, right? I can step on the roof deck and hear if the plywood decking is cracking, if delaminating under my feet or not. I can feel, so there's a lot of things you can do with a drone that I can't do, a lot quicker too. But, you know, so it's really about like, what do you want to do for your clients? What information do you want to provide? And how are you going to provide it, right? Logistical kind of things. And then it's all about marketing as well. So if you're a home inspector who's competing against me, maybe you're going to do a drone and you would compete against me, right? Because I get up on the roof of ladders, but you're doing drone. And maybe that's something that your client base prefers. And so you're going to beat me in the market. We're going to compete with what type of service services that our, our individual companies provide that are of value to our particular clients, right? So maybe I'm using infrared on every inspection and maybe you're using infrared, but you charge $200. Maybe I'm in demand or maybe you're in demand for, maybe you're making more money, maybe, I'm, you know, so it's a competition about the services you provide that are of value to your clients and making money. Um, and there are advantages of using infrared. There are advantages of, not carrying an infrared camera, I think. Uh, maybe there isn't. Infrared, I think everybody should have a flashlight and infrared camera. Do you report black plastic mi mastic missing on outside chimney in your image? Well, it wasn't missing. You don't need, you don't need black sealant anywhere on flashing. I mean, if, if flashing is installed properly, uh, you don't need sealant, really. I mean, it's really just a Band-Aid. And some Masons put it, like if they're going to groove flashing into a cut in a masonry brick, right? They'll, they'll bead a little silicone there. But it's not necessary, you know, because it's masonry and metal. And if it's installed properly, everything's just going to get diverted away. When you rely on roofing tar, Forget it. That's a Band-Aid. So when I see a, black, a bunch of black roofing tar and ceiling all gooped up and everything, then yeah, we've got a problem. Someone's using stuff that's not going to last one season, one year. And it's going to crack open and we got a problem, right? Um, have I turned the Q&A stuff off? I don't know. I hope, I hope I did. Okay. Um, let's see, a little bit laggy. Oh, sorry. Missing cracked caulking at the front door header. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, think about it. Um, you know, missing cracked, uh, miss a uh, cracked sealant at the top door header underneath. Like, so wind has to come down and go up and in. So I'm not, you know, you got to be uh, aware of how picky you want to be. Do you want to be nitpicky? Then you mention that. And if your clients appreciate that, then you should do that. So there's some things I just have to pass over. Stains is another thing, you know, scratches on the front door. I could have commented on the patch, the poor patch, the masonry patch on the front concrete stoop. Doesn't even look good, right? It's aesthetically bad. And the patch is probably just going to fall off in the next year, right? But how picky do I want to be? Um, so also, if there's a child in the home and needs a railing for surfacing, yes. Now, remember, there's a difference between handrail and guard. Um, they, in code, we used to call them the, the same thing, right? Handrail, guardrail, some, but now it's handrail. It's, the, it's defined as anything that's graspable, you know, handrail. That's what you grasp. And a guard is that which it's a barrier to prevent you from falling off, okay? Don't use guardrail, use guard and handrail. Um, sometimes those two are together. Um, bah, 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 bah. Uh, we can't go through unauthorized property in my area, neighbor's yard. We can't go on an unauthorized property in my area. Well, you know, if you're on a public sidewalk, street, parking area, yard, common yard, you can take a picture of something. 
you know, and put it in a report. Just don't, you know, disclose confidential information like someone's address or something. Um, I don't know my old systems. I'm looking at the text. I, I, please use uh, questions. They are designed for the floor required. Okay, I think I'm done with chat. Okay, if you have a question, use the Q&A feature, please. It's just so much easier for everybody. Let's see, this is the laundry, um, gas dryer, gas shutoff valve, exhaust for the dryer. It goes out over the drywall, studded wall, through the ceiling of the basement. There's the drop ceiling. To, I can't see what's going on, right? And it goes outside. And we saw the exterior vent. So that's the problem there. And also, I want to take a measurement of how long this thing is. So in code, in the 2021 IRC section M, I think it's for mechanical, it's like chapter 15, M1502.4.6.1. How long is a dryer supposed to be? This section actually is one of my favorite sections. It's really long. They've really added a lot of things like they talk about booster fans and uh, other kinds of assistance fans and by the manufacturer when it's a really long vent pipe. What is the maximum length of a dryer exhaust pipe? All dryers need to go from the dryer to the outside, has to exhaust outside through a, a hood that's fully openable. No restrictions like the picture there, that's a defect. But how long is the maximum length of that dryer? Let's say it's just a straight shot. How long should it be? Anybody know? Great, Michael, 35 feet. Sean, it's it's 35 feet. It used to be 25 a while back, like a decade ago. Now it's 35, right? And there's all, all these exceptions to it as well. And then if there's a bend or a turn or a twist, you have to shorten that length, right? And so I, I can do it almost now just by looking at it. I can figure out how many feet there are, but if it's close, I'm gonna get my measuring tape out. And I love doing this on a new home construction, right? And making sure that there's always an exception. There's always some kind of, you can see a label on the manufacturer's thing or something like that. But if there's an exception, it should be on the dryer pipe, exhaust pipe or on the, or on the appliance itself that this is allowed to exhaust a certain length. But in your head, think of 35 feet. That's the maximum length right now, according to code. And I think that's too long, frankly. It was 25. And we started making homes that are really big. And we put the dryer in the wrong location. And the builder was like, well, we have to exhaust it, but we're not going to exhaust it to the front. We're going to exhaust it all the way to the back. So poor architectural design. And they just changed the code. They just lengthened the code. If it didn't work for the builder, let's just make it longer now. Now it's 35. I don't like it. Um, but I'm not a code inspector, thank goodness. Attic. So I'm in the attic, right? What's What time should it be in my head if I'm managing my time and being efficient and making money? If I start at eight o'clock, I should be in the attic at 10. If I'm in the attic at 10, I know I'm making money because I'm managing my time well. I'm managing my client well. I'm managing this whole project really well. I'm in the attic. I'm taking a look at the trust built roof built by trusses. I don't want anything cut or modified. That's the one thing. I don't want to see any watermarks. If I do, I'm going to try to probe it with my moisture meter, right? I don't want to see any missing insulation there. That's a shaft too. So I'm not sure about the fire here, but for sure there's something going on, something missing. I don't see any flashing in the stud wall. This is a stud wall. This is an interior stud wall. And there's no, oh, sorry, there's no insulation on the walls, in the wall cavity. I see studs going down and there's no insulation. Here. There's no insulation here. There's no insulation here. This, this is a weird, something's going on here. Like there's something missing here, right? Tell what, I had a, a recommendation to have an insulation contractor come in because we have other problems here too. Water marks around the chimney flashing. Maybe, you know, they fixed the flashing, remember? They tore out all that goopy tar they installed the flashing properly around the chimney stack in the new layer of shingles. So I think we're okay there, but I'm going to make it as a monitoring recommended because any roof can leak. Here's the bathroom, second floor bathroom exhaust. 
all exhausts, kitchen, dryer, all mechanical exhausts, bathroom, they should exhaust outside. And outside doesn't mean in the attic. And it doesn't mean in the attic insulation either. It means in the attic. I mean, it means outside. Outside means outside. That's what code says. And code says outside. It has to go to the exterior. It has to terminate to the outdoor air outside of the building. So this is uh, just dumping moist, warm air into the attic. And so it wasn't exhausting. It was probably just dumping right into the insulation, exhausting right in there. So they moved the insulation away. Great. That's not energy efficient, right? This is an easy fix. A couple other things with the electrical too. Could be fixed there. So this is truss built, right? Made by two by fours fastened together. This is a two by four stud and I can see half of it. Where's all the insulation? That means this insulation is about an inch and a half thick. Where's all the insulation? I bet the, the heating and cooling, the cost of heating and cooling this house are outrageous. I bet the second floor is a different climate zone than the rest of the house. There's no insulation here. They're missing insulation. I think they were store. I don't think people have been storing things up here. I don't think this is mouse compacting the insulation. I think not a lot of insulation was initially installed in this older home, right? Probably the standard was six, eight inches or something. Now it's like you need over a foot. And people were storing stuff up here, I bet. There's no, that's a two by four stud there exposed. So that's, I can see three inches of that. There's very little insulation at all. A lot of missing insulation and you're not supposed to do that. So that they do this, homeowners cut into the truss and this is the top part of the truss. And um, they put the electrical wire there so that they can put a piece of wood down for storage. So that's what that was going on. So we have problems here. We have a structural problem and we have um, previous uh, activity in the attic that compressed all the insulation down to nothing. The attic access panel is not insulated, right? So that's my ladder. And I always put down a picnic blanket so that I can put my ladder that gets into the attic uh, on, an, on something that's gonna catch maybe some insulation, and keep things clean. Bathroom, there's two bathrooms in this house. Full bathroom upstairs. This is a small little little townhouse. Second floor bathroom and there's a first floor half bath. And basically I, I flush everything and run everything and try to make something leak while I'm there. And if I can make a leak, great. Um, if I can't, that's okay. So take a look at that. That's a it's an S trap. Everybody gets all excited over S traps because they gurgle. It's an easy swap out for a P trap. Shouldn't have an S trap, P trap. GFCI protection, first floor bathroom, same thing, flush the toilet, run the sink, look for leaks, GFCI protection. Interior, now I'm moving through the house, I'm working my way to the kitchen. The interior is pretty easy because all I do is representative number of electrical receptacles, representative number of doors, representative number of windows, walls, ceilings, floors, things like that. Ceiling fans, Taking a look at everything, steps, stoops, ceilings. You know, one of the tricks is, you know, if this is the bathroom area, use your infrared camera and scan the ceiling below the second floor bathroom, right? Windows, more windows, doors. Oh, that looks like a deadbolt with a key on the outside. Okay, but there's a key on the inside. So interior key deadbolts from the inside make an emergency ha uh, exit hazardous. So that's no good. And test the smoke detectors. And we got a, a missing uh, malfunctioning closet door. Very simple. More pictures, take a ton of pictures. I probably took 150 pictures, 200 pictures in this inspection. Maybe 40 of them appeared in my report. This window here does not stay up. It's a guillotine. So you want to fix that. And I'm in the kitchen. I'm feeling really good. Did a great service. Did a great job. I'm going to do the kitchen. 
wrap things up, click a button to do a summary. I can even do, if I was putting pictures and videos in while I was inspecting it, I can even do the entire report right then and there. Run water at the sink, the old dish sprayer, garbage disposal, drain, supply. There's a dishwasher, I run a short cycle. What if the dishwasher leaks on the floor while I'm standing there? That's fantastic. That's the, one of the best things that can happen to me as a home inspector is I turn on the dishwasher and it leaks all over the floor. That is absolutely, it's happened to me. It's fantastic. You know what I do? I take a picture of it and put it in a report. I didn't break anything. I'm here to find problems. And if it happens to leak or break or fall apart or something like that. Now, if I find my clots, I'm a big fella and I knock something off of a shelf or something and it crashes, I'm going to take full responsibility for that. But like an appliance that leaks and it's not supposed to leak during an inspection and it leaks, yeah, that is something that's going to be in the report. I'm not buying a new dishwasher. I'm doing my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. So there's the gas burners of the old gas stove. Um, it's not attached. It doesn't have a safety anti-tip device. But I turn on the oven, turn on the stove, turn it back off, looking at the cabinets, making secure, making sure that they are secure to the wall and the countertop. The floor is very old. It's got scratches and things like that. Again, this is all cosmetic. My client may want me to comment on the blemishes. I may or may not. I'm not required to. And the fan, this fan is just recirculating. It doesn't go outside like it's supposed to. And infrared, this is like an infrared shot. This isn't from this property. It's from a previous one. But like I saw this, like it was a patched up area. Like, oh, there was a leak in the past and they patched it up. That's nice. But if you take a look at it with an infrared, it's still wet, right? Can't tell that from here. It's still wet. Yeah. What were they doing? Like, they, what did they, they patched the drywall and didn't fix the leak. They patched the drywall, didn't fix the leak. <laughs> That's what you get for an infrared camera, right? That infrared shot tells me they patched the drywall and didn't fix the leak. If you look at that as a home inspector or a real estate agent or an occupant or a new home buyer, that looks like, oh, yeah, that looks okay. It's a little, it wasn't patched very well, but it, everything's okay. Mm -mm. That's why I carry an infrared camera. You see things that you wouldn't normally be able to see without it. Here's a summary. I give a summary report, one and a half page report, no big deal, no pictures, just things that are major. Correction and further evaluation is recommended, right? And I tell my client, read the full report. Most people don't. There's my inspection report, table of contents. What really matters in a home inspection is like page three. What really matters are major defects, things that may lead to major defects, things that may hinder your ability to finance, and safety hazards. That's what really matters during a home inspection. I'm trying to set my client's expectations about what a home inspection is when a home inspection isn't. Am I supposed to find dry rot everywhere? No. If I don't see it, I can't report upon it. A little uh, compliance statement, like I'm certified and trained and I'm going to do these things. And, and I use these phrases like monitoring recommended, improvement and repair recommended, correction and further evaluation recommended in my inspection report. And that's what these things mean. And in my report, things are black text on white, blue for headers. And anything that's red means it should be fixed or monitored or evaluated further. Like circulating fan is making a rumbling, wobbling noise. Correction and further evaluation is recommended. That's in red and it's in caps. So nobody can say, well, I was confused. You used green colored font. I didn't know green meant bad. Everybody knows red is bad. So that's my recommendation. If you're gonna put anything bad in the report, make it red, capitalized, bolded, italicized, <laughs> you could just say, your honor, like, I don't know what else I could have done in the report. Like I'm trying to get their attention, okay? So I don't throw every picture in the report, but a lot of them are in there. And people like pictures, people like video as well. We saw the videos. 
And so this is my inspection report. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but feel free to email me. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that the report, this report is available for you. Um, you can copy paste how I write things, like how I, like every, like for here, up here this is the structural basement section. And it says, we're not structural engineers. Feel free to hire one before closing to consult with and address concerns you have with the property. You know, you don't find out identify structural major defects. Go ahead and hire a structural engineer if you want. We inspect these things by probing a representative number of structural components where deterioration is suspected or where clear indications of possible deterioration exist. I'm not inspecting everything. You know, and probing is not required when I think it might damage the property. So those things, you, you may want to throw that in the inspection report to set your client's expectations about what a home inspection is and is not. There's pictures of the laundry. There's the kitchen. There's that window that keeps falling, right? Won't stay up. And here's our client here. A little, little thing with our clients who don't show up at the inspection. We prefer to have our clients represented during the inspection a few reasons. We can answer all of your questions and address all your concerns as they come up. But if they're not there, then we can't do that. If you're there, you know, we can. If you're not there, we can both see the condition of the property at the same time in the inspection. So if you're there with me, we can, we can both see what is going on. And if you're there, I can elaborate on what may be complicated or technical, right? There's a little summary of the standards of practice. Illustrations make your, uh, the quality of your inspection report gets boosted by really good illustrations. And you can get these illustrations from InterNACHI's gallery of inspection images and illustrations. You can have them in Spanish as well. So that's in my inspection report. And then there's a, a conclusion and walkthrough. You know, ideally we would schedule a pre-closing walkthrough when we're scheduling a home inspection. So you schedule two inspections. And then you can also schedule a yearly home maintenance checkup inspection. There's three inspections you could possibly schedule at the time, at one time, right? The home inspection and then ancillary services. That's how you increase gross revenue. One of the best ways to increase gross revenue is offer additional services like home inspection and a radon test, home inspection, radon test, and pool inspection or something, right? And then schedule the pre-closing walkthrough. Maybe it's free, maybe it's $50, and then a one-year home maintenance checkup. See how things are going after a year. You want to help your neighbors keep their homes in good shape. And this is what we do in the last page. And then we leave a letter for every homeowner or occupant saying we wore indoor only shoes. We tried to put things back where they were. If you have any problems, just give us a call and things like that. Um, I can see you guys are chatting. That's really good. I have to drain to the floor, to the pan serving water or to a waste receptor. Yeah. Oh, um, I see chatting, 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 35 feet, reduced. Yep. Deadbolt, interior. What do you think about TAP inspection software? I, I have never used it. Um, I have spoken with other inspectors who love it because it's literally like they just tap it, tap, 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 tap. Um, what do you charge for pre-closing? You can do it for free or 50 bucks. Uh, <laughs> Christopher said, holy crap, I just got my Florida home inspector license as I'm watching this. <laughs> Congratulations. Go to nachi.org slash Florida for all the other things you may need to be a successful home inspector. Nachi.org slash Florida. Yep. Congratulations. Good job, Christopher. Um, all right, y'all. My name is Ben Gramico from InterNACHI. That was a webinar. And you can contact us at any time. Here's three URLs I want you to know about. Natchi.org slash contact, natchi.org slash webinars, and natchi.org slash everything for everything you need. That was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the 
the chatting and the questions and people from all over the world. Um, that was a lot of fun. So be safe and uh, I'll see you on the next home inspection webinar. Thank you, everybody. Bye.